Good evening, all. My name is Lina, and I have the pleasure to welcome you to our online conference tonight. I am working in the office of the Protestant Church in Germany here in Brussels, and I am also a member of the ecumenical team of the Chapel for Europe. Tonight's host of the online conference on tackling racism in Europe, historical, theological and practical truth. Let me start by saying a few words about the format of the conference. We are holding it, uh, it as a webinar, which means we cannot see you and you can, cannot see each other. But you have the opportunity to ask our panelists questions here down below via the Q&A button or on Facebook where we will be live streaming the conference too. Please make plenty of use of, of this opportunity. We will also record the conference though, so that you can later forward the video to other interested parties if you want to do so. I will now hand over the floor to Fabienne Alcaraz. She's a very committed member of our lay volunteer team at the Chapel for Europe, leads morning prayers here in the Roman Catholic tradition, and is also one of the coordinators for the prayer groups within the EU institutions. And she happens to be an EU official working in the European Commission, although also not especially, especially in the field of anti-racism policy. This evening, she is here in purely personal capacity. We are sure she will do a wonderful job guiding us through this evening. Welcome and thank you, Fabienne. Good evening, welcome uh, to uh, all of you on, on board of, uh, of this journey tonight. It's a great pleasure for me to uh, be moderating this event. As uh, Lina just uh, introduced me, I'm a late person in all the meanings of the term for, uh, for, that, person, for that purpose. Uh, and uh, uh, I, uh, I really look forward to this exchange tonight to get deeper into the various aspects of um, racism and systemic racism uh, uh, here in Europe and what our churches should, could uh, do to, uh, uh, to promote anti-racism and uh, to, uh, uh, to address, to sensitize uh, our, uh, ourselves to, to this issue. I would like to introduce our panelists for this evening. Um, the first, first of our three speakers uh, will be Professor Dr. Volker Küster. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, Volker Küster is since October 2012 Professor of Comparative Religion and Missiology at the Johannes Gutenberg University in Mainz. He is also Vice Dean in the Faculty of Protestant Theology. His many academic publication and research, in, and research interests include in particular intercultural and contextual theology. This was the subject of his PhD, which he obtained in Heidelberg. He was ordained a minister in the Protestant Church in Germany in 1999. Thank you again for joining us tonight. Our second speaker will address more the theological aspects. Uh, she uh, is a tutor and lecturer in political theology. Selina Stone, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, you are a lecturer at uh, St. Milaitis College in London. Uh, your doctoral research at the University of Birmingham looked at the impact of Pentecostal theology and ministry on issues of social justice. You're all, you also have a master's degree in theology, politics and faith-based organizations from King's College in London. Your experience is at the grassroots as well as in the academy. That's very uh, appreciated for uh, our uh, uh, 
discussion tonight. For several years, you have worked at the Center for Theology and Community as a community organizer and developing programs for on-church engagement in community organizing. Thank you for your contribution tonight. And last but not least, our third uh, speaker tonight will uh, be uh, Reverend Canon Lusa Nsenga Gongoy. Uh, he is the Black and Ethnic Minority Mission and Ministry Enabler for the Diocese of Leicester in the UK. Uh, you were ordained a priest in the Anglican Church in Canterbury Cathedral in 2008, and you attended Theological College at Cranmer Hall in Durham uh, holding a master's in ethics for also from King's College uh, in London. Uh, so thank you for uh, joining us. I understand that Brussels is uh, a place you, you know, although you're joining from the UK tonight, uh, Brussels is a place you know well because you, you grew up here. So welcome back in a way, even if it's only virtually. And thank you very much for accepting to, uh, uh, to share your uh, experience with us uh, tonight. Uh, without further ado, um, we'll get into the, the topic uh, for tonight. We have chosen this, uh, this week um, also to commemorate uh, the death of George Floyd, uh, who was murdered on 25th of May 2020, just a, a year ago, uh, by a white police officer, Derek Chauvin, who knelt on his neck for nine and a half minutes in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, this awful event triggered an unprecedented wave of protests worldwide uh, under the, um, uh, the catchword Black Lives Matter. And uh, one year has passed. We, uh, we wanted tonight when we prepared with the ecumenical team of, uh, of the chapel to see what has happened since then, what has been the response, response of people of faith. Uh, do the church, our questions tonight are, do the churches have a role, a specific role in the de development of ideologies around race, ethnicity and whiteness? And what are our role in the past, our role today? And that's why we have those three aspects uh, in, uh, in the title of our conference tonight. Uh, historical, theological, and practical uh, views on uh, this issue of, uh, of, right, of racism. These are the questions we will be exploring, and our evening will be uh, split into three parts. First, we will give the floor to our three speakers, Volker, then Selina, then Lusa. Then we will have an exchange between the speakers uh, coming back on uh, some uh, aspects of, of their uh, first interventions. And then the third part, of course, will be turning to you, our, our audience, uh, whom we thank you for join, for whom we thank for joining. Uh, and so our last part will be dedicated to question and answers. Uh, you can uh, contribute uh, by sending your questions in the, uh, using the question and answers uh, button at the bottom of your screens. You can do it all through the evening because uh, Sarah Jane, the member of the team who agreed to curate the questions, will be following, uh, following them and gathering them for this third part of the, of the evening. But don't hesitate to intervene and ask your questions as, uh, as we go. So uh, I thank you again for joining us tonight. I uh, have a thought of prayer uh, that uh, our exchanges will uh, enlighten us, inspire us, and I give the floor to uh, Professor Kuster. The floor is yours. Well, thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me to this event and also for the kind introduction, Mrs. Moderator. Um, you put on me the historical uh, task, which is of course a huge one. So I decided I will try out uh, to be sharp and short in 12 theses on the relationship between racism and religion. I'm speaking as a German contextual theologian, so I will refer to my uh, German context, but of course I'm teaching intercultural theology, so I will have 
uh, also an intercultural perspective while um, tackling the issue. The first thesis is mission and colonialism often went hand in hand. The right to take other people's goods and lands was claimed because the conquerors saw themselves as superior to them, vilifying the others even as non-human. Accordingly, the Christian faith was seen as a superior religion claiming the absoluteness, taking people's souls and blessing the colonial powers as facilitators of Christianization of heathen lands. Second thesis, the conquista followed the reconquista. The reclaiming of Spanish territory from the Moors and the expulsion of Muslims and Jews from Christian lands in 1492 was followed by the search for new territories and riches and the expansion of the Christian faith. Thesis three, the modern missionary movement of the 19th century was a lay movement. Becoming a missionary was a promise to social upward mobility once one could survive the hardships in the mission field. This mentality unites merchants, settlers and missionaries who all sought themselves superior to the people whose goods, land and souls they took and whom they preached the Christian faith. <clears throat> it was the white man's burden to quote Ruit Kipling, to bring them civilization and salvation. Becoming Christianized meant to become westernized. Thesis four, <laughs> yet there were also missionaries who went different paths, honored other cultures and brought schools and medical care. The Christian faith proved to carry a liberative message against its own messengers. Many independent leaders were trained in mission schools. While Christian faith is obviously ambiguous, colonialism is not. Thesis five, racism as a thought through concept is a product of the dark side of enlightenment. As a social practice with often religious overtones, it is much older. Racism as a social practice with varying religious overtones tones also existed in India, the caste system, China and against Mongol intruders, Muslims, etc., and Japan against the Buraku. The question is where else, or better, where not? Thesis six, racism is self referential. It changes according to context and usage. In the United States, since we commemorate the death of Floyd, for instance, Afro-Americans are still segregated and discriminated against as cheap labor force. Mexican-Americans are made strangers in their own land. Native Americans are assimilated to solve the land question. Asian Americans are designated as a model minority, yet they remain the perpetual stranger. White suprematism has clear religious overtones, as has racism. Manifest destiny and the white man's burden paved the way for imperialism and empire. What racism is should be determined by those who are discriminated against. Thesis seven, the relationship between the racism during times of German colonialism, 1880s to 1919, and antisemitism needs further exploration. While there has been what Germans call Vergangenheitsbewältigung regarding the industrial killing of six million Jews, the guilt of German colonialism has long been neglected. Only recently, the genocide among the Herero and Nama in Namibia has been recognized and the discussion about reparations and an official excuse begun. 
In the current debate on the comparability of genocides, that question of who is claiming the exclusive right to interpretation, to what end, has to be addressed. Thesis 8. The entanglement of Christian missions and the Third Reich still has to be further researched. Werner Ustov's thesis that part of the German mission establishment plans the colonial politics of the Third Reich has been vigorously denied by many mission functionaries and colleagues without sufficient proof to the contrary. Thesis 9. Globalization. The spread of neoliberal capitalism at first sight seems to have universalist tendencies, neglecting cultural religious differences in order to even better spread its goods. Yet, religious fundamentalism, including terrorism, is well integrated in these structures. The distribution of production always seeking the cheapest labor force in countries with the lowest human rights standards is racist. Thesis 10. Beyond postcolonial critique and melancholia, a decolonization of the minds is necessary that develops strategies to combat racism. Religious claims to absoluteness have to be re renegotiated and rid of their racist overtones. Thesis 11. Identity politics and means to overcome racist di discrimination are endangered to perpetuate the very structures they oppose. The this system plays the different agents against each other. Intersectionality, the awareness that structures of oppression are interconnected and that diverse interest groups suffer from the same causes should eventually lead to deep solidarity, a concept I take from Kwok Puilan and Jörg Rieger's book on Occupy Religion. My final thesis, 12, intercultural theology creates a platform for dialogue between different contextual theologies and a habitus of respect, recognition, and empathy. As contextual theologies were post-colonial, avant la lettre, intercultural theology was intersectional. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Christer for uh, this uh, introduction. Uh, already a lot of food for thought in these 12 teasers. And uh, yes, uh, most of them are very teasing indeed. <laughs> Thank you for, uh, for this. We will uh, very uh, happily come back to, to this in a, in a moment. I would like now to give the floor to our second speaker, Selina uh, Stone. The floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you, Fabienne. And, um... Thank you, Professor Costa, for that really great first offering. Um, I'm really pleased to be able to offer some theological reflection into this, particularly because, as Professor Costa has just made very clear, Christian theology has had a very particular role in colonial history and in the legitimizing of racist structures, of colonialism, of enslavement. And so because Christian theology, and I should be clear that we're talking about white European theology, has worked hand in hand with racist philosophies, it's important for us to interrogate them, to see in what ways theology has played that role of legitimizing racist structures, and to also begin to think of how we might read the scriptures and understand Christian theology in ways which undo the damage that has been done historically. So this is, I think, a really important um, contribution. Even, of course, I'm slight biased as a theologian, but I do think it's important, even if you weren't, to be able to understand the philosophical underpinnings of white supremacy and um, racism. And so, of course, the scriptures have been used and weaponized against um, colonized peoples around the world but they've also been used as a tool for liberation. And so really what I would like to do is offer an example of this in my reflection today. There are of course many places we could turn to for theologies which challenge racism and white supremacy. And as we've just celebrated Pentecost, I thought it would be quite apt for us to look in the book of Acts 
because Pentecost is celebrated in many traditions as a birth of the church, the moment at which the Holy Spirit promised by Jesus to the disciples arrives um, in this Acts 2 story. And from this moment on, we see an empowerment of the disciples to live out this alternative way of being which Jesus models in his life and death and resurrection. And so in the book of Acts in chapter 10 specifically, we find a story which I think really helps us to see how Christian understandings of God and, and this story in the book of Acts particularly helps us to understand um, a more inclusive message of what the gospel, the good news of the Christian faith really is offering to people across lines of racial difference and particularly the ways in which the scriptures offer us a message that stands against ideas of supremacy of particular races over and against other peoples. And so I'm going to give you a summary of the story because it is quite important and I will read a little bit of it um, for those of you who have heard it before. So in Acts chapter 10, the story is told of Cornelius, who is described as a God-fearing Gentile. Gentiles being those people who were not recognised as being part of the people who were chosen by God being the Jews. Um, and so Cornelius has a vision in which an angel tells him to send a messenger to bring a man he does not know called Simon Peter back to his house. And he does this. And the scene then changes to Simon Peter, who is oblivious to this vision that Cornelius is having. But Peter's going to pray at noon and he has his own vision of a large sheet descending down from heaven with lots of creatures which were all ritually unclean for the Jews. And a voice says to Peter, kill and eat. And he, as a good Jew, says effectively, there's no way I'm going to do that. He says, I've never eaten anything unclean or impure. And the voice replies, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happens three times. And Peter has no clue what this is about. And at the time when he's trying to figure out what this vision means, Cornelius's messengers arrive. And the Holy Spirit says to him, three men are looking for you, so get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. And Peter arrives at Cornelius's house, and I will now read the section of the chapter from this point. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. But Peter made him get up. Stand up, he said, I'm only a man myself. While talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. He said to the people, you are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objections. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised, the circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. So what does this have to do with addressing racism and white supremacy? Well, this story captured in Acts 10 demonstrates to us how seriously God takes the divisions that we create and sustain, which include some people and exclude others from God's welcome. The line between Jews and Gentiles was one of the most concrete aspects which defined Jewish identity. The Jews were told to be separate from Gentiles in the Old Testament, to not intermarry or engage with them in their cultural acts. These forms of what we can understand as divinely sanctioned racism have historically underpinned white supremacy within white churches as white European Christianity has imbibed the notion that it has superseded Israel as God's chosen people since the coming of Christ. 
The chosenness of white European Christianity and its divine calling and destiny has been the bedrock of colonial missions historically and continues to appear even in today's political landscape as white Christians in Europe continue to see themselves as the true center of Christianity, even while the numerical center of the church has shifted to Africa, Asia, and Latin America. In Acts 10, God initiates a tearing down of this divide between those who are included and those who are excluded from God's promises. The previous order in which certain groups were considered to be the pinnacle of creation or the center point of what God is doing in the world is eradicated. The fullness of God's promise comes closer to all people through this encounter between Peter and Cornelius. In Cornelius, as Willie James Jennings has suggested, we find a man of contradiction. He is in, Je in Jennings's words, Cornelius is in the old order, but his actions are preparing him for the new order. He is a Roman centurion, a leader and a master of slaves, who is also considered to be God-fearing, whose heart is open to God and to be moved. And so Cornelius can represent for us those people who have privilege within the status quo and yet are being called to participate in dismantling it. Cornelius does not realize that by accepting this invitation, his life will be made completely new and will be transformed into the ways of Jesus, who's, in whose kingdom the first become last and the last become first. Peter is also a person in transition, a faithful Jew who understands what he must and must not do to please God, or so he thinks, who is now moving towards a deeper faithfulness that looks on the outside like a rejection of God's commands. But God is in the text, the one who is initiating these shifts by the power of the Holy Spirit. These shifts are simultaneously disturbing and wonderful, but both Cornelius and Peter can only be participants if they choose to be. The reordering of the lines of inclusion of, and exclusion is only possible because they use their agency to obey God, though they are uncertain, and obedience is costly. Cornelius sends his messengers to a complete stranger, and Peter accepts the invitation of a stranger, which results in him crossing lines which felt unacceptable for him culturally and religiously. Their willingness to follow the spirit past the point of their comfort expands their own understanding of God and God's ways. And it also increases the church and clarifies the, ch and clarifies the church's witness in the world. So this is one way in which we might think theologically about what it means to address notions of white supremacy as an invitation of the spirit to move to the reordering which the kingdom of God as Jesus modeled is seeking to bring about in the world. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Selena. Very uh, inspiring uh, choice of, uh, of uh, scripture passage. Uh, and yes, thank, it's, uh, it's enlightening to me to reread uh, this, uh, this chapter 10 in, in this particular context. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm now uh, giving the floor to uh, Reverend uh, Lusa and Sengangoy. Uh, floor is yours. <laughs> thank you, Fabienne. And, uh... I hope that my words in many ways will be consonant with what we, we've heard so far. And I should probably preface my thoughts in saying that my particular social location is one that is hyphenated in relation to my own engagement with church and society. Uh, so my perspective bears intonations that uh, betray a complex multi-layered identity and should be heard uh, as culturally and theologically accentuated. Uh, my lived experience of church straddles across uh, ethnic, linguistic, uh, cultural, theological, and denominational lines. And in the various church contexts that I've been involved with, one common trait I have noted was the quasi-universal aspiration to develop church communities that were integrated. The reality, however, paled in comparison. In 1963, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. famously said, it is appalling that the most segregated hour in Christian America is uh, the worship hour. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. It arguably still holds true across many of uh, our European context, with many churches and networks split along color, ethnic, cultural, or linguistic lines. This de facto segregation of the church does not of itself suggest racism as an exclusive cause. However, it is impossible to discount racism from any exploration of the fracture of the church across ethnic lines without considering the evidence drawn from the experience of Christians of global majority heritage in their engagement with the church across Europe. That experience suggests that racism is indeed rife in the church. It is manifested in personal expressions of racial abuse, as well as structural, systemic and institutional barriers that limit and frustrate the full presence and participation of Christians of global majority heritage, both in the life and in the structures uh, of our churches. In February of last year, Justin Welby, the Archbishop of Canterbury uh, and the head of the, the Global Anglican Communion said that the Church of England was deeply institutionally racist. Is the church racist? Uh, I think having to raise the question is in itself an indication that there is an issue. Uh, part of the answer to this question lies in an exploration of the context, the culture, and the ideology that has birthed the expression of the church, uh, or the Western church, should I say, as we know it today. Building on what uh, Volker and Selena have offered, uh, I would contend that churches tend to reflect the societies they live in. They are not really the creators of society. Christians, like their fellow citizens, seem to be defined by the fundamental philosophical assumptions of their world. As such, the Western church is inducted in a pervasive yet often subconscious ideology that poses whiteness as a normative expression of its identity, creating spaces in which the other is either uh, exoticized or vilified. And relationships with that other are essentially framed around transactional lines. That in essence is an expression of a church whose identity is deeply rooted in imperialism and colonialism not merely as historic events, but ideological assumptions. Uh, such a vision is essentially preoccupied with the task of subjugating and colonizing the other, their world, their mind, uh, and ultimately their soul. It's implicit philosophical assumption that uh, favors classification and categorization uh, has given way to expressions of Christian mission and ministry that seem more concerned with cultural imperialism and wholly committed to the forces of assimilation and alienation. It views the world through a polarized and binary lens uh, and treats it as either a hostile territory needing to be conquered uh, uh, or uh, a space that needs uh, to be uh, somehow um, cultured in a way that reflects uh, some of the essence uh, of the ideologies that sustain and frame and shape whiteness. How might a church that has mobilized and committed its resources, its people, its finances, its theology, uh, and so much more to the cause of an ideology that legitimizes, le legitimizes the assumed superiority of some over other become a haven of inclusion and mutual flourishing. Thankfully, there has been examples in the past and recent history of alternative or, or counter narratives that have shaped the response of the church in respect to ethnic diversity. Most of them have usually emerged out of a process of critical engagement with the assumed theory of knowledge that enshrines white normativity as an acceptable frame for for, churches, for the church's mission. This has led to processes of deep listening and honest engagement with the legacy and impact uh, of racism, of imperialism, of colonialism and, and slavery. 
exploring uh, issues such as the imbalance of power, as well as the assertions that some could only be guessed uh, in the church. There is uh, something about uh, a rediscovery of our identity as a sacramental community and a Eucharistic community that sets Christ as uh, the host uh, around which we gather, uh, recognizing each other, each other as guests uh, around that table. That sadly has not been the experience of the church. The task of the church is perhaps to help us uh, decolonize, as Volker was saying earlier, something of uh, our self-understanding and therefore redeem uh, our definition and our expression of what it means to be human created uh, in the likeness and the image of God. To be attentive to this task is also a commitment to liberate the imaginative capacity of Christians everywhere to the extent that we are able to engender the beloved community, confidence in her identity in ways that foster a deeper sense of interconnectedness and interdependence, recognizing neutrality of worth and value in Christ and committed to the service and flourishing of the other. And in the words of uh, the Ugandan Catholic theologian, Emmanuel Katongole, to live as the body of Christ in such a time as this is to reimagine what it means to remember and embody that story of resurrection. Even in a deeply divided world, even in the most deeply divided relationship, the way things are is not the way things have to be. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lusa. Uh, indeed, uh, when uh, when we uh, when the ecumenical team of the chapel prepared this evening, uh, that was very much uh, uh, one of uh, the lines of thoughts that the way things are uh, is not uh, what the, they uh, they should be, and uh, and that was our uh, our aim uh, to bring you together to bring. Uh, uh, bring us uh, to thinking further and deeper about uh, this uh, presence of racism in our societies, but also in our churches. Thank you very much uh, for your three interventions. Uh, I would like to come back, uh, I suggest, uh, to start the discussion with the, the three of you. So I invite you to uh, unmute your, yourselves uh, and um, uh, launch the the discussion um, of, uh, on one uh, one sentence. Uh, Lusa just mentioned that uh, racism is uh, rife in uh, in church, uh, and also this uh, uh, this uh, sentence uh, about segregation in church, and that indeed uh, we still celebrate separately. Uh, I would like to have your your view about uh, about that. This is also something that is close to our uh, to our questioning in uh, in the EU institutions uh, where uh, where would you see lines moving and where would you see possible balances uh, between feeling uh, in uh, in one's community with people you're close to typically uh, in Brussels people who speak your language or on the contrary uh, pushing the walls further and 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 broadening uh, uh, broadening this uh, this space for for celebrating together. How do you how do you see that uh, question of uh, common celebration or segregation? Is it okay you can... a, yeah. Uh, okay. I'll I'll, I'll start. Uh, I, I think we probably need to recognize that there is something about uh, the human mind and the human uh, nature that is gregarious, where we kind of. Uh, congregates around people who give us, uh, who reinforce our sense of who we are. Uh, and that in itself ought to be celebrated uh, and, and ought to be acknowledged. Uh, there is something, uh, and, and I refer back to what Selena was saying uh, about uh, Christian identity, that is an invitation, not simply to, uh, to elevate homogeneity as the ultimate expression and the ultimate aspiration of human experience, 
but recognizing that actually throughout scripture, there is something fundamental about uh, a human identity that is defined and, and released uh, into relation and neutrality. And relation and neutrality that constantly invites us uh, into places of dislocation. Uh, the story of, of, of Abraham being a, a, a perfect example of that, where the encounter with God somehow uh, calls Abraham out of his context into a world a much wider, much bigger, much deeper than it had ever experienced then. Uh, and that becomes uh, the journey of faith. And, and we often refer as Christians as, as pilgrim people. So what might it look like for us to embody that pilgrim uh, posture into life and how might that enable us to create spaces uh, where our stories are weaved uh, or woven sorry uh, across uh, each other's into a tapestry that uh, somehow signifies something of the ultimate vision uh, of, of the church as uh, uh, expressed in the vision of John of Patmos uh, gathered across ethnicity, across cultures, across language, different people group, uh, and all committed to the sole task of uh, glorifying the name of God. Thank you, Selina. Reaction on this uh, question of uh, uh, dislocation, which is very close to what you developed in the... Uh... Yes, and I think, I think I have very mixed feelings about this. Um, the whole the concern about homogenous churches um, and this is partly because I grew up in a black majority mainly Caribbean principally Jamaican church to put it bluntly and that was my heritage um, and it, we had in our church people from other parts of the Caribbean also some West Africans you know Nigeria Ghana a few people from Uganda were there as well but it was a overwhelmingly black majority church and we had a handful of white people who were married to black members of our church who would come as well um and as, as a as a black girl who's from an ethnic minority group in britain that was a very important part of my upbringing it was very important for me as a christian young woman to see people like me running a church to see with black women preaching to see black people in leadership this is not what I've seen as I've got older and been in more in white spaces where the leadership is often held by white men principally and sometimes white couples, even when there are black people in membership. So I'm kind of, I, I'm a little bit worried sometimes when the conversation is the rush to get lots of mixing. My concern is how are white majority churches safe communities for black people and other ethnic minorities? At the point in which that has been addressed, then I'm all for um, intentional mixing of people. But I think they can be quite harmful spaces. And I think we've seen that even in Britain, we've seen a lot of books have been written. I think about Ben Lindsay's book, talking all about the black experience within white majority churches in Britain. And, you know, and I know this like personally from having experiences myself is that the, the issues around power and race mean that those spaces are not safe spaces for us. So I think there is a lot of work to be done. And I know that's what a lot of people have been doing in the last year in trying to interrogate what is happening in, in white majority spaces that make them unsafe and how can some of those issues be addressed. Thank you. Dr. Kister, and reaction to uh, this uh, question of uh, Community, communitarism. Well, I mean, my 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 perception is ambiguous. If if I look at the German situation, on on the one hand, you have migrant churches who use the church building of the mainline Protestant white uh, churches, um, and sometimes there is interaction, and sometimes there is not. Um, then there are a few regional churches uh, of the EKD, the, the German uh, mainline church uh, organization, um, who try to make migrant churches member ch congregations. Yeah? So you have a Korean church that is part of the uh, Hessen uh, church, for instance. 
uh, but it's still a Korean church, of course. Yeah, so Koreans are worshiping there uh, together. Then, then the uh, some of the big mission agencies um, changed their policy in the sense that they said we are a community of churches, so we should share resources. So that for United in Mission in, in Wuppertal, uh, the EMS in Stuttgart, and also Basel Mission became Mission Twenty One. Similar things happened in the UK with CWM. Yeah, so they said, you know, it's not about transferring our resources there, but it's about sharing of resources. And the idea is also now that, you know, a church from Indonesia still contributes to the budget, of course, lesser uh, than than the German church, but it, it makes them more equal. So these experiments are there. Um, so that is a, that is certainly an attempt to 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 overcome this old missionary thinking of of mission from the from the west yeah but taking seriously the the member churches but yeah then if 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 i look at at at, at the acra de declaration of 2004 uh, i was there and then you could see you have this ecumenical body who wants to be uh, of course, a mixed a mixed church, but if if it comes to economics, people get uh, you know very uh, fuzzy because they think, oh, we have to go home and then we have to stand up uh, for this aqua de declaration in our churches with bankers and 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 high politicians and so on. And um, so then you can see that that the churches from the global uh, south clearly opted. You know, at this moment against uh, global capitalism, but uh, the church representatives from the European churches were very uneasy about this whole thing. Yeah, so and I think the, the power question and 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 the question who is defining, uh, who and who has the power to define are very important. You know, I'm I'm, I'm an academic theologian, so if so, so I would say, you know, I'm a, I'm a white academic theologian. I still define at the moment what theology is and what not. You know, even as as Selina clearly pointed out, the majority of Christians are, are already living for a long time yeah, in the global south. And 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 the Christian today is a black woman, mainly of Pentecostal background, yeah, uh, which is struggling to survive, poor, no education, and not anymore the white male. But the male, white male may still, you know, define what what. Christianity is supposed to be the real Christianity. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I mean, we have to we, we we have to tackle these power questions. And the other hand, I I see, you know, I mean, I'm not totally uh, pessimistic. I see things happening. Yeah, but but we have. I think we have to be aware if it comes to money, if it comes to to global capitalism, then things become itchy. Yeah, uh, and we and we have to reflect on that. And that has that has, that has right, racist overtones, certainly. Yeah. Uh, thank you. We we've uh, had this first uh, uh, roundtable about our churches inside. I uh, would like to have the second uh, round uh, roundtable question about our churches outside. Uh, where would you see um, the the role of churches in uh, in this transition today? Uh, to to tackling uh, racism and 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 being witnesses in today's world, uh, where would you uh, where would you see the priorities? The first uh, the first things you would uh, uh, you would like to see our churches to to address. Feel free to take the floor. Go ahead. <laughs> I, I spoke first, uh, I probably will defer to, to my colleagues there, not wanting to monopolize the mic. No, no, please. I mean, I, I think that, you know, I think the churches have a really important role to play. And it, it's a difficult question because as we've begun by recognizing how churches have struggled and sometimes have just not intended at all to name and address racism, there can be that real um, conflict about how a church which itself has not dealt with white supremacy and, and issues in, of its history of colonialism and racism, how it should publicly speak about or engage with wider social concerns. 
um, around inequality and race. So I, I think there's a real tension there around the church, the church's public voice being undermined by its failure to embody its own kind of espoused theologies around inclusion and love of neighbour and all of that stuff. So I think that's a really important question. I don't think that, you know, this means a church should be inactive publicly, you know, and me and my students often wrestle with this question a lot. You know, the church will never have things right. So if it waits for its own perfections before it does anything publicly, the it will never do anything, you know, in terms of its public ministry. So I don't think that's the answer. But I, I think that as churches begin to speak more openly and to name the problems and to help their congregations, particularly as they're growing in discipleship, that there's a real need for people to understand how much of a collective effort it's going to take to tackle these issues. So a congregation that is filled with parents, teachers, police officers, people who run businesses have to understand that in each of their roles in everyday life, they um, have a role to play in, in, in dismantling these philosophies of race, of white supremacy, in conversations with their children, when they come across things on TV, when they're in the office, to be as alert for these issues of racism as they would be for any other kind of evil that they would hear about. You know, we wouldn't see violence, you know, on, on TV or in the office and just allow it to happen. We would take responsibility for condemning it, for calling people to a better way of being. So I think there's a need for everybody to recognise that we all have a role to play in understanding the history of these ideas, the outworking of these realities and systems, as well as the interpersonal relationships, and that we, with the help of God, are alert to it and are willing to name it and call it out, even when it's costly and uncomfortable. Thank you. Wow. Uh, both Celine and, and Volker earlier had, had referenced uh, uh, some sort of uh, shift in uh, s some of the hermeneutical lenses that the church has used in engaging with scripture uh, and sometimes engaging with its own identity. Uh, and I wonder whether th there is a gift uh, in one recognizing that every theological expression is contextual. Uh, but because every theological uh, expression is contextual, it can only have part of the answer to the questions that we're confronted with. And therefore we need to be in conversation with uh, other perspectives that may help us reframe some of our epistemologies and, and some of our, of our hermeneutics as well. Uh, and, and I'm struck when engaging with the church in the West, uh, especially in, in recent years uh, of hearing the uh, the, the increase of the language of, um, of lament uh, as, uh, as the voice of the church, uh, especially the church in the West. And, and I often work from the assumption that lament is in fact the cry of the oppressed. And so when the Western church uh, uses the language of lament, uh, implicitly it's framing itself into uh, the skin and the position of the oppressed. And therefore, my question to the Western Church would be, if you are the oppressed, who is oppressing you? Uh, and so if there isn't necessarily an, uh, uh, an identified oppressor, then chances are we may be the oppressors. <laughs> and therefore, if we are the oppressors, then lament is not the cry that should raise from us, uh, but repentance. Uh, and repentance, uh, at, uh, at least in, in its uh, Greek uh, kind of meaning, uh, is... Uh, a recentering of the mind uh, uh, and uh, inviting people to be in the right mind uh, when we talk about metanoia. Uh, but there's another Greek word or, or a Greek related word that, that we use quite regularly in our, uh, in our world, which is paranoia, which is being beside uh, one's mind. And I wonder whether there is some work that the church needs to do about identifying where it locates itself. Uh, in, in respect to, to, to that conversation. And if we are therefore serious about our commitment to transforming the unjust structures uh, of society, one of the five marks of, of mission, 
then uh, perhaps our, our posture should not be that of lament, but that of repentance. And repentance from a biblical perspective is always uh, uh, working hand in hand with reparation. And therefore, how might the church explore uh, its obligations towards reparation? And I'm always quite um, careful to, uh, to add that reparation ultimately is never a transactional uh, uh, movement or trans that transactional moment. Reparation is an invitation to, to restore something of the fullness uh, of God's purposes uh, where it has been um, injured. And so how might we as a church recognize something of our responsibility in not just wounding the other who is ethnically different, but failing to live up to the uh, absolute of our vocation uh, to be agents of healing and reconciliation in the world. And I think that compels us to start the process from a place of humility. Uh, and from that, we may then find the language and the posture that may give us the credibility that may um, enable the process of change and transformation uh, to happen. Thank you very much. Professor Kuster, how do you see the role of churches? Well, I, I, I keep uh, my ambiguous perspective, I guess, yeah, because I see on the one hand, churches create spaces of negotiation in, in, in conflict situations. Yeah? And, and if I look at the German churches uh, after the, the experience of the Third Reich, uh, they slowly started yeah, to, to look into their, their history and there was repentance. Yeah? But, you know, I mean, if you look at, at, at Germany nowadays, uh, um, terrible things can be said again about Jews. Yeah? So I, I think the, the, the churches again have to refresh yeah, um, this, this reflection on what it means to be, be church in, in, in Germany in that respect. Um, I mean, there has been a lot of engagement in, 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 in the so-called 2015 refugee crisis from, from many, many churches yeah, who, who addressed issues of, uh, of racism. Um, but yeah, on, on the other hand, I think that Selina said that earlier, I mean, church is also a mirror of, of society. Yeah? And, 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 and so you... The, the, the church is a mixed body and then um, if the pastor uh, tries to preach every Sunday uh, his leftist or her leftist agenda then then also people you know get tired out so you know I mean uh, it's I, I think it's a difficult way uh, to go um, and, and there are these prophetic mo moments, certainly. So I keep a certain optimism, uh, but it's also uh, sometimes I would wish uh, there would be more, uh, yeah, metanoia or repentance, uh, uh, of course. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I mean, I was I was thinking about this. What 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 Luther said about lament uh, i mean there's a lot of lament also because churches in in, in europe are shrinking yeah? and 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 i see a certain orientalistic fascination for those migrant churches and the pentecostals selena yeah? because then the, the people from the main, mainline churches look and say oh they they grow and they are lively and our you know what's happening in our warships so this is also you, you, you know, it, it, on the one hand, uh, it has something positive in it because it's, it's appreciative of what is happening, but it's also a form of othering. Yeah? So, um, again, um, the question is, how do, you, how do you live out the Christian faith with all these different traditions? Yeah? Because I must admit, um, if I sit in a Korean Pentecostal service, uh, I wish I go back to my small Minjung congregation, you know, so uh, uh, there, are, there are many different uh, cultures within the churches as well. Yeah. And um, 
you know, I mean, if, if, if you look at the global source, churches have been playing an, an, an tremendous important role as, as liberation movements and, and creating platforms for reconciliation and so on and so forth. Yeah? Uh, but then again, you know, that's what I said at the beginning, the, the message turns, turns somehow against its messengers. Yeah. Um, so there, there have been, I, I, not everything is black and white. That's what I, what I tried to say, I think, in my fifth thesis. You know, there have been missionaries who tried to do it differently. But, but all, all in all, mission and colonialism went hand in hand, and we have not yet really decolonized our minds. That's, that's what I would, would, would still say. Yeah? Uh, and, and that's what I see. In, uh, even in the ecumenical churches who are trying to, you know, integrate all different kinds of, of traditions. Uh, if, if we talk money, then it becomes, uh, and if you start to make political statements, then it becomes still very difficult. <laughs> so we have still a long way to go, I guess. Uh. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I have to interrupt uh, this uh, uh, round table. I would like now to turn to uh, Sarah Jane, who's been following the, the questions asked both on Facebook and uh, in the question and answer session in, uh, in, uh, in Zoom. Sarah Jane, uh, would you uh, please come in and, uh, and bring us the, the questions of our, of our audience for our speakers, please? Yeah, thank you. We have a, a lot of questions, so I'm going to try and group some questions together. And the first set is really a set of theological questions. So. There's, there's four points really. Um, one is how can we understand the way in which um, Noah curses his grandson Canaan in Genesis 9 and this story has been somehow imposed upon black people and spoken over black people and people of colour to justify slavery in a theological way. How can we make sense of that? Um, to what extent does the understanding of sin as a personal matter get in the way of tackling racism as systemic sin? Does that emphasis on personal conversion, personal relationship with God, have a risk that faith becomes a question purely of individual salvation? And how can this be addressed? Um, there's a question around black theology and how we can understand black liberation theology as having a contribution, given that the gospel was proclaimed originally in a Hellenistic world, and that was the original understanding of the gospel, how can we hold these two things together? And how can we see faith from God's perspective? So I realize I've just thrown a whole load of questions at you there. So I would invite you as the spirit leads you to come in and pick whichever or all of those you'd like. Thank you. These are really great questions. I guess this is me, this is my lane. So I'll start and you can help me brothers as you feel led. Um, Yes, I mean, I think several of these questions can be answered by a point that I think all three of us have come back to, which is recognising that all theology is contextual. And by that, we mean that sometimes we can imagine that theology falls down to us from heaven and that we have nothing at all to do with the conclusions we come to about God and the understandings we have about God. But in reality, when we're thinking about God and we're reading the Bible and trying to understand what God might be saying to us, we're doing all of that as real tangible people in real bodies, in real communities, with a particular social location. We've been shaped by so many other ideas, not just the ideas about God and what we see in the Bible. So all of that helps us to shape our theology. So when um, the person asking about how does the story of Noah cursing Ham become used as a weapon is because it's contextual. Because white supremacists who read the Bible were looking for stories they could use to reinforce the enslavement of African peoples, particularly. And they thought this story made sense. They wanted to find a narrative to help them to legitimize slavery. And the story of Ham was available for them to use. Now, if they had read that in dialogue with African peoples, that I think, and, and considered their readings of the scripture to be equal to theirs and to be crucial to their discernment of the scriptures, that could have been avoided. 
but where interpretations of the Bible are done in isolation and used to control others, to um, undermine the dignity of others, we end up repeating this history even today. So I often say to my students, you know, we can look back now and say, how ridiculous was it that we read the Bible in that, or not we, but it, the Bible was read in those ways. But today, when we read the Bible, we can often risk doing the same thing to other groups of people when we take the Bible literally to suit our particular agendas. So I think that speaks to the ham question. Um, and it also speaks to the one about personal and systemic sin. So again, this is a fantastic question. And again, one of the ways in which theology has been um, determined by particular groups with a particular concern. So the individual focus on sin means that as long as I am pious, as long as I go to church, as long as I do my Bible readings and confess to the priest or have my communion, it doesn't really matter what I'm doing to anybody else. It doesn't matter what I'm participating in socially and politically, as long as I can kind of focus on my inward spirituality. Um, and when we think about faith and spirituality in those ways, it becomes inevitable that we do harm to others because we fall out of whack with the greatest commandment that loving God and loving neighbor go hand in hand. So I think that problem about individualizing our understanding of sin is at the base of so many of our big justice issues as it is that we can't see what the Bible makes very clear, particularly in the Old Testament, which is that nations are judged, communities are judged for turning away from God, not just individuals and their choices. So I think black theology, I think to answer that question, speaks to all of this. I mean, black theology has been so crucial in challenging these Western individualized understandings of sin, these interpretations of stories like Noah, which have been weaponized against black peoples. So black theology, Dalit theology, all theology from around the world is so crucial for us as we're discerning what the Bible is saying. And I'll stop there. Yeah, I, I, I won't add much. Uh, maybe just a, a couple of points. One, one on, on sin, uh, the, the challenge or the tension between personal and, and corporate sin. Uh, I wonder whether part of it sometimes is also framed into a particular vision and definition of personhood. Uh, so in societies where uh, human identity is defined essentially as collective, relational and interconnected, then there is uh, an understanding, an immediacy in the understanding that what one does is not just uh, a private matter. Uh, it, everything is public in many ways. I come from uh, a, a culture and a society in which uh, the, the private, the public, uh, even temporality, past, present and future, uh, uh, and the sacred and the profane, uh, in many ways are, are collapsed into uh, every moment of life where Genesis uh, and Revelation in some ways belong in every instance, in every moment. And therefore every action speaks of all of that at once. And so every action, or oh, oh, there is no action that is disconnected and detached uh, from uh, what links us to those who came before us and those who will come after us. Uh, and and it, I mean, for those uh, of us who are interested in, in the environment, there is also that sense that actually there is no uh, neutral footprint in terms of our human life and, and our, our human relation uh, in relation to, to sin. And sin spoken of not as an aggregation of mishaps, uh, but sin spoken of in the singular, uh, which uh, reinforces uh, and exacerbates fractures. And therefore, the language of redemption then becomes less about virtue signaling, uh, but becomes more about uh, a reorientation of the way one lives uh, in ways that um, project or uh, facilitate the expression uh, of God's image. Uh, deeply ingrained in each of us. Uh, and, and so my sense is that 
what I don't want to dismiss the, the, the reality of uh, personal and individual responsibility in relation to sin, I believe that there is something redeeming uh, in uh, engaging with the notion of sinfulness as, uh, as a corporate reality. Uh, and therefore, it also means that there's a sense of uh, relationship uh, and responsibility to the other. Uh, I guess it goes back to uh, the first murder in, in the Bible, where God uh, seeks Cain and then engages with, with Cain and, uh, and asks him of the whereabouts of his brother. And Cain responds uh, by the very first questions asked by a human being to God, am I my brother's keeper? Some may suggest that the rest of scripture is written uh, to answer that question. Uh, and, and we may argue that actually it is a resounding yes. And, and therefore, uh, I can't see sinfulness only as an isolated experience. It, rem it takes me back to that question. I am my sister's, I am my brother's keeper. Uh, I, I, I was going to comment uh, on, on another point, but I'll, I'll, I'll stop here for now. Well, if I can come in on this whole sin issue, then, uh, you know, if you look at individual sin as being estranged from God, that means, you know, you are busy with greed, uh, and even the Buddha will tell you also, yeah, this, this is, then you miss the path to salvation, then every liberation theologian would agree that there is something like individual sin, yeah, so the accusation that they gave up the concept of individual sin for the structural sin, is not true in the first place. Second place, the great contribution of liberation theology introducing the concept of uh, systemic sin is that they say, you know, also the oppressor needs to be liberated. That was already what the, as the Latin Americans were saying. Yeah? And, and the younger generation, like, like post-colonial feminist theologians, Busa Dube Kokpuilan, they say, well, even if it hurts, the colonizers have to sit on the table. Uh, and that's what, what, what you earlier uh, addressed as uh, this whole issue of repentance. And if you look at Jim Cohen's first book uh, already, uh, black, about black power, uh, they say this is, so white, white theologians said, oh, this is racism in reverse. But it's not, you know, because at the end of the book, he's speaking of re reconciliation uh, already uh, in 1969. But yeah, it's costly reconciliation. Yeah? So there has to be, there has to be repentance and metanoia. Yeah? And, and, and so I think the, the concept of, of structural sin and also sin againstness, so there are people who are sinned against, uh, helps us to, to address the whole power question, uh, but helps us also to say, well, you know, I mean, these people who, who are police and, and, and military and turn the, the violence against uh, their own people. Um, they are part of the structural sin. And that does not mean they don't have to, to, take in, to be taken to court, but they have to be see also seen as human beings uh, who are uh, uh, somehow uh, entangled in this whole uh, power structures that, that, that rule our world. Uh, and and there will be no there will be probably no change if 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 we don't talk with each other as as oppressors and oppressed. Uh, but on the other hand, and and that's what I learned from from South African discussion is uh, sometimes the perpetrator does not want to repent, and still the victim has to go on. Yeah. So this was, if you look at the whole history of the. The, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And that's why I started theologically to, to talk about self-reconciliation. And that's what you learn from, from Black is Beautiful, yeah, is, is first of all, yeah, start trying to get it to, to overcome what has been internalized for so long. Yeah, so self-reconciliation is, is a very important theological paradigm in my view uh, to get things started yeah, because well, if you look at the South African case, then there have been examples that the perpetrators came forward, but many more examples that they didn't. Thank you very much. Uh, 
uh, I see that uh, time is, is flying, but maybe Sarah Jane, you would have another uh, another question, maybe not a whole uh, group, but one one question uh, that you would uh, would uh, see in, uh, uh, in our uh, audience's uh, reactions. Yeah, so we have some um, practical questions, which about how can we speak about this better in churches, particularly where it looks like everything is kind of fine on the surface, where we don't see racist speech or overtly racist behaviour, how can we better understand the lived experience of Black and ethnic minority members? And what should churches be doing about it? So, for example, here in Brussels, Black people can face discrimination when trying to find an apartment to rent or from the inspectors on public transport. And of course, that's against the Belgian legislation that is implementing EU race equality law, but still it's happening. So what can churches be doing about this? What is left for the individuals to do? Um, and how can we move from an individual desire to be anti-racist to actually ending systemic racism? Well, if, if, if I may start, what, what I probably would say is that a lot of energy is sometimes uh, divested towards attending to structures and systems. Uh, and even in the definition that we use of institutional racism, we, we talk about failures uh, in terms of policy practices and procedures. Uh, but there's another P that we tend to forget, which is people. Uh, and and for me, there is something about uh, reminding each other uh, that uh, it is through people that uh, institutions have their lives. Uh, it is through people that policies are implemented. It's through people that practices are developed. Um, and so perhaps uh, there is an investment that we need to, to put in uh, in recognizing, I guess it takes us back to the conversation we had around, around sin uh, and responsibility. So in, in the same way as we don't want to dismiss the responsibility that one has in relation to sin, uh, we also want to reaffirm the responsibility that each of us have in fostering that uh, ideal that I believe all of us aspire to in, in some ways. Um, and, and my sense is that you know, it is about being curious about the, the other, uh, curious not in a way that exoticizes or problematizes the other, but where we are uh, willing a bit like in uh, Oriental uh, traditions where greetings, uh, the greeting namaste is uh, a way of, uh, you know, the the divine in one bowing uh, to the divine in the other. So, so how do we recognize that and, and create relationships that elevate uh, the other's humanity? Uh, and the last thing I would say is that in my experience as a black man in mostly white churches is that uh, I, I was often tokenized and I was often reduced to uh, the color of my skin or the ethnicity that I was part of. And I was used as, um, uh, as a tool to help the church, the church's own narrative. Mm -hmm. But the church was not so concerned with the experience that I came to church from and that I went to from church. And so how might we, uh, as Christians become a bit more interested in the lived experience of, of, of people, uh, especially those who have been marginalized and minoritized, uh, not just when we come together, but the whole of their lives. And I think once we become aware of their, rea their lived reality, then we once we know, <laughs> we can't unknow. <laughs> and once we know, uh, Either we decide to be oblivious to it uh, or we step in and take responsibility in becoming the agents of change. Other reactions to this question? Yeah, I mean, I think I just want to add that um, 
that, you know, when we're thinking about engaging on this issue, I think it's important for us to remember that people of global majority heritage are not a monolith, that some people have no desire to talk about race. They don't believe racism exists. Some black and Asian people, my ethnic minorities, they're not, they don't want, particularly if they're wealthy and life's generally comfortable, they might be completely happy with life as it is. They might not even believe in racism or want to talk about it. So I think it's important to not kind of paint everybody with the same brush and I'm sorry that's an English analogy um, but not to simply imagine everybody feels the same way about race and everybody wants to speak about it particularly outside of relationships so you know as Lisa says if you as a person of colour spend any time in a white majority institution at some point your face is going to be on a poster on a website sometimes without your permission um, because of the desire to promote a certain narrative of inclusion. And that, that is one of the most, um, it's almost it's a dehumanizing experience to be reduced to your mm -hmm. color. Uh, it's, it's an experience of, of, of just quite of shock sometimes. I've been asked to do the most ridiculous things, knowing that it's because I'm a black woman and I tick two boxes. So I think it's important not to treat black or Asian people as if they are just black or Asian and nothing else, but to be aware of the fullness of the person's life. As Lisa says, you know, understand the person as a whole. What is their day-to-day -day life like? What is it that they, but not in, the, in a way that's intrusive, but out of natural organic relationships. And in, in churches, sometimes we really don't do well at this. We sit next to one another in a service we might exchange a piece, but we don't really know what that person's dealing with in their day-to-day -day life. Maybe culturally we find it awkward to intrude by asking, but maybe the, the depth of relationship that's required in our churches, and I say churches, but in society in general, is one of actual care for one another, where we care, genuinely care, not because we're gonna take that story and make a, a blog about it for the church newsletter, for Black History Month or anything else, but just because we care about that human being and we want them to be well. So I think where there's genuine care and genuine love, this becomes easier. But when there isn't that relationship depth, it becomes a process of instrumentalizing people in their stories. And that's where more harm can be done. So um, yeah, I think that's what I'll say. Thank you. Uh, I would like um, to to launch the uh, one one last question before we we wrap up. Um, where one quick question to each uh, each uh, of of our speakers tonight. In the one year that has passed since uh, uh, the death of George Floyd, uh, would you uh, could you point uh, to us? one sign of hope, one thing you have seen moving, uh, uh, one, uh, one example uh, that had, uh, that you, an example of, yes, a, go a good sign, a, go a piece of good news. Uh, we, we've, uh, and, and, and rightly so, uh, we have discussed tonight what, uh, what is going wrong and, and what should be addressed. Uh, uh, I would like for this last, uh, last round to, um, to to ask you to to share one uh, one element of the past year that has touched you and that you see as a, as a sign of hope or a good example or a, yeah uh, a piece of good news. <laughs> Which of you would like to start? I will. Um, and this is a very personal thing. It's not something that will serve anybody else. But what, what immediately jumped to mind was in the wake of George Floyd's murder, the kind of amount of discussions and panels on race that were happening. And one of, I had a, a friend, a white friend who had previously been quite hostile in a conversation we'd had about race once. 
and 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 did what lots of white people can do when that when race is talked about get very uncomfortable and, and try to shut it down and and sideline your your perspective on what's happened um, and she came back and apologized and said i didn't realize at all what i was doing in that conversation and why and i didn't raise it with her because i didn't i thought you're already hostile already so i'm just going to leave you to think on that response but when she came back to me I thought actually these are these are the small victories for me I can't really speak to the bigger systemic issues because I think they will take years and generations to change but I have the hope that she is somebody who's training to be a priest and when a black woman in her parish comes to her with a story she would know how to handle that better now and those little things I think should be celebrated Thank you, Selena. Fabiana, I, I'm really grateful that you, you asked us to think about that because there, there's often the risk when we engage in these conversations to, to feel that uh, it's a one-way traffic and, and a traffic towards doom. Uh, and, and I think we are, uh, as Christians, we are people who are future-oriented and in a future that is framed in, in hope. Um, one of the signs of hope, so, or as a, a friend of mine, a colleague of mine, I'll, I'll often say, a glimpse of glory uh, has been part of the, the work that we're doing as a diocese uh, here in Leicester, where for the past uh, couple of years nearly, we've been involved in a process of uh, helping a number of churches to transition from uh, monoculture uh, homogeneous uh, expressions to much more uh, uh, to spaces of, of belonging uh, uh, and and I've been really humbled in seeing the generosity in which people have been able to sit together and and share in mutual fracture and mutual woundedness and brokenness and recognizing that actually racism wounds us all uh, racism disables us uh, all in, in so many ways and, and, and recognizing that the only way out of this uh, is not through polarity, uh, is not through accusation, uh, it is uh, through a commitment uh, to journey together. Uh, it will be a long process, it should be a slow process, but we want to get there and we want to get there together. And I think for me that that has been really uh, encouraging uh, and, and I want to hold on to, to that vision and to that commitment as, as an expression of Christian aspiration that is not simply uh, pandering to a walkish ideology, but that wants to be rooted into what we understand as a gospel imperative, a missional imperative, and, and an, ex an existential imperative. Thank you. Volker, last word from you. Well, I'm a bit hesitant to give up my, my ambiguous stance. Yeah, you see, uh, <laughs> so you, 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 you probably want to end this nice, so I will do you the favor, but I, by saying, you don't have to be, be truthful. I mean, the, the last word in our uh, in the talk today is uh, historical, theological, and practical truth, and truth is key. <laughs> well, you see, I mean, it, it was encouraging that that Black Lives Matter came to Europe, yeah, uh, and, yes. and and see mm -hmm. demonstrations here as well. But yeah, I see also also this tendency in in Europe to 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 the right wing politics, yeah, and and to populism, and then. Uh, uh, I don't. You see, you have both, and 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 it's a it, it's a mixture. So that in that context, I do theology, and what encouraged me was that my African and Asian doctoral students spoke up about their experience in the group with my white uh, uh, students, and I think that was a very um, healing experience, I guess. Yeah? So there is hope, but it's hope in the midst of crisis. I mean, I we sh we should be aware of that. Yeah? Thank you. Yes. Um, thank you for uh, uh, for participating tonight. Thank you to our audience for staying uh, uh, later than uh, than we had planned. 
uh, I would like to deeply, I mean, really, uh, from my heart, thank our three speakers uh, of tonight for uh, um, for pointing to uh, the crisis uh, and and the deep rooted uh, racist tones, racism that is in our uh, in our churches, in our thinking, in our societies as well. Uh, thank you for um, showing uh, uh, a number of uh, of ways. Um, I, uh, I, will, uh, I will continue uh, thinking about uh, the, the, 12, uh, uh, the 12 hints uh, of uh, Volker, uh, Volker Kuster. Uh, thank you, Selina, for uh, the, the example of Cornelius uh, and Peter. And indeed, it must have been uncomfortable for both of them. <laughs> Uh, they, they've been, yeah, they, they must have been uh, shaken by, uh, by this en encounter. And, and Lusa, thank you for uh, uh, your focus on uh, uh, dislocation. Uh, this, uh, yes, metanoia um, in, in Greek, this, this idea of uh, trying to, to see uh, through the other one's experience, not dismissing it as being different. Uh, foreign to, to me, but as being, yes, a brother, a sister uh, that I, uh, I should uh, journey with and, and try to understand better and, uh, and, um, and understand with my, with my heart. So um, um, I would like to invite uh, all of, uh, of our audience to, uh, uh, well, to think further. We, I think we had a lot of food for thought exchange tonight about these uh, um, this journey ahead of us uh, for uh, uh, for being a better uh, better churches, better Christians where we are. Um, thank you also for for the image of uh, being all the the guests of one Christ uh, and uh, with all uh, with all our differences. So uh, uh, I invite uh, each of uh, of you to uh, not our speakers, I mean our audience, just like I will myself try to after tonight, uh, uh, tonight's exchange, think of one thing, uh, one thing to do to, to practice this uh, dislocation and, uh, and be uh, closer to our, uh, uh, to our true, true vocations as, uh, uh, as, uh, as Christians. Uh, thank you very much for uh, the inspiring thoughts. Uh, I think uh, I think it was the first time we had uh, a conference at the Chapel for Europe, namely on, on racism. We had addressed discriminations and, uh, and other, uh, other aspects of social injustice. But uh, I, I think we, yes, that's, uh, we, we, have, uh, uh, we have food for more, uh, uh, more, th more reflection. Uh, we have, um, uh, 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 yes, I would say a tough journey ahead of us. Uh, coming from a long way <laughs> but thank you very much for your insights uh for for sharing tonight and i uh i give the floor now to um uh christian sova for uh for the closing words well i will not be very original because i will repeat thank you very much thank you fabien selina lusa Folke, for this very inspiring and also with the still uh, message of hope at the end for this evening. This evening is virtual, but we will find the way to hand you something real as our thank you. Um, the traditional coffee cups of the chapel with the kind of spiritual proposal, don't tell God you have a big problem Tell your problem, then, that you have a big God. Of course, filled with the good Belgian pralines. I also want to thank uh, all the people you don't see at the screen right now. So, Lina from the Protestant Church in Germany, Brussels office, who welcomed us at the beginning. Uh, to Sarah Jane from the St. Paul Anglican Church in Tervuren, who managed the question. Both Lina and Sarah Jane are also from the communicant team of the chapel and friends of the chapel and get great work in preparing this conference. 
Also, thank you very much uh, to Sabina, Laura and Wojciech uh, from the communication team of the Chapel for Europe. I can only encourage the audience to, as Fabien already said, to write down one, two ideas you took from this evening and to share it with others. Not only share, just to be, I would say, contemplative in action. Also do something if you are inspired. And last but not least, if you'd like to support the Chapel of Europe and all its ecumenical and multicultural activities, after this evening, I'm more and more aware that actually the challenge of our Christian churches is not really ecumenical get together, is much more multicultural get together. So if you would like to help us to carry on our mission, developing this culture of dialogue, so you find the link uh, on the chat, it should appear. And thank you very much for all your contributions. Thank you for staying with us tonight. The recording of this video will appear on our uh, YouTube channel and on our Facebook in this day. Welcome again to the chapel virtually or in presence. Hopefully the situation will allow us to organize something presential as soon as possible. Have a good evening and God bless.